Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal, be, Car Conscious Caracal here. It's been a while. So today I'm talking to the co-founder of the Rational Standard, Nicholas Wood Smith. And he's going to, I'm going to give him now the mic over to him so he can give you some reasons on why you should care about who he is and about what exactly the rational standard is. But welcome to the show, Nicholas. Well, thanks for having me. Um, why you should actually care about me? That's a deeply subjective question. But um, firstly, I'm the co-founder of the Rational Standard, an alternative media uh, site from, uh, hosted in South Africa. We have, we're mostly famous for being right-wing nut jobs. And that's what um, a, a claim that our opponents call us, which we proudly present, even though we'd also argue that right-wing, uh, right-wing, left-wing, stupid, <laughs> stupid concept. Uh, for other reasons that I should, uh, you should care about me, uh, besides that I have feelings, <laughs> is that I'm also a science fiction author and uh, engage in the hang of law of libertarian activism through Students for Liberty, um, the Institute of Race Relations, and you know quite a few other things, but mostly Rational Standard, which I hope you all read and enjoy. <laughs> right, no, this is the this is the place to be if you want to listen to some right wing nut jobs. So you'll fit right in with the the lineup we've had so far. So my first question then would be just to give people a bit of an idea of. You've already given us a bit of an idea of where you lie on the spectrum, but we okay. So you self-identify then as a classical liberal or as a libertarian. So the thing about the classical liberals and libertarians is a lot of nuance, uh, nuance in the uh, the ideas, but for practicality, a libertarian is basically just a slightly more radical classical liberal. They both effectively believe the same things. They have the same principles. The difference is a libertarian doesn't so well a classical liberal believes that um to a degree that government is more of a necessary evil libertarians will start leaning slightly more towards that either it is not necessary at all and then you'll get the uh, anarchist libertarians anarcho-capitalists or they'll believe that it's not necessary but it's going to happen anyway i'm more around that I don't believe that it uh, uh, that government is a necessary evil, but I believe it's going to happen regardless. I think it's a natural human phenomenon, but I do. Be and I believe that the way that we should view the world, uh, that libertarianism is the way that I view the world, that government is a a construct of violence, and that power cannot be innocent. It's not virtuous, but it's here to stay. And for what, where it comes into my practical policy is I believe that the further that we move into uh, towards libertarian policies of basically making the government as irrelevant as possible, either through the agorist, uh, um, the agorist method, which is basically just creating private sector competitors to the government. So things like AfriForum, where they basically run their own go uh, government services, to things like crypto, which eliminate the need to, of central governments, or the more uh, traditional political uh, methods of basically going through the legis uh, legislature, which is does it hasn't really been working. So I'm slightly more leaning towards mm. the agorist side of it. <laughs> right. Okay. No, um, I see in the chat, Kaiser MJ says, I'm a monarchist. Uh, yes, Kaiser. I'm also pretty close to a monarchist. I also believe that the, the government should be limited, but not completely abolished. I do think there are certain things that it can do well, like just diplomacy and a very basic, uh, infrastructure for the for the country and at the same time uh, i didn't know that uh, the the more extreme version of a classical liberal was a libertarian that's an interesting interesting remark you did there but yeah um so your site or the the rational standard describes themselves as always honest always independent always free South African political uh, political commentary from a classical liberal slant now as i said off air to you you're one of the few media outlets in South Africa that actually puts their bias out there instead of claiming to be this middle ground or this centrist figure while then clearly being biased in their reporting and what they uh, decide to publish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was actually the main thrust why we uh, founded the Rational Standard was that we noticed that everyone is biased to a degree. Anyone who claims they're not biased is lying. And even when you have something which people would see as a perfect algorithm to try to create some sort of unbiased news, someone had to program that in the first place, so it's going to end up biased. 
So the only way that we can actually have honest news is when people actually are honest about their biases. So we knew that there's so all, uh, that most of the sites, uh, media in South Africa, if is either centrist to a degree where they're kind of politically ineffective or they're extremely left wing. So we founded in the we were founded in the context of the fees must fall and rose must fall stuff and seeing how all the media, without exception, were taking their side and not reporting anything that could actually uh, demonize the student, uh, student movement. But because a lot of our journalists, including myself, were on campus at the time, we had a first hand account of how dreadful this movement actually was. Right. And it's that type of citizen reporting, as I call it, that I think makes alt media so attractive. That's something I realized as a just a, a regular voice in South Africa as well for foreigners. Uh, that's why I grew on Twitter and why my channel grew. Just my own theory is that people around the world, and I mentioned this when I was talking on, when was this? Uh, I think on my previous podcast. I was talking about the idea of people are tired of uh, seeing this guy in his 50s in a suit uh, earning a six-figure salary reading off a teleprompter, and that's how they get their news. People don't like it anymore. And that's why, for example, a, a good uh, anti-version of that is uh, Sticks Hexenhammer, who's a YouTuber who has long hair, wears like a leather jacket, no undershirt, um, <laughs> has like a fallout flag in the background, nothing, doesn't read off a teleprompter, just speaks his mind. And that's his brand. His whole brand is being the anti, the anti CNN anchor. He does exactly the opposite in terms of optics and aesthetics. And I think people find that attractive. People find that being more that looks more genuine. It's it's almost like an unconscious uh, decision that people make. They don't consciously decide, okay, I like this guy because he doesn't look like a news anchor. I think unconsciously their mind realizes this person just looks more trustworthy and more genuine. He looks more real because he doesn't care about his perception or how the audience perceives him. And I do think that's what makes alternative media so so attractive in the modern era, is that we have a realness to us. We feel more real. We feel more like real people. We don't earn six-figure salaries. We don't have corporate donors. We don't have huge uh, political endorsements or anything. We're just regular people, usually citizen reporters, that are doing the real investigative reporting that the media should be doing, but we're just picking up the slack. Mm, definitely it's it's more sincere and it's also um it's why alternative media has been growing as you said and it's also because there's a huge disconnect between the actual events and uh the reporting and it in the, i think this has always happened i think that it's not that the media has gotten worse i think it's just that we have alternatives now and what <laughs> very succinctly alternative media <laughs> and in the well, in the olden days of a few decades ago, maybe even only a decade ago, people didn't really have a choice. If they, um, if the reporters told them something, they just listened because there was no, uh, there was no alternative. But now we've got um, so much of the news and policy outreach from the news makers, who are the people who actually are the generate the news, the people who are creating the events, who are creating the legislation. We can actually get the news straight from them. So for Donald Trump, for instance you can get most of his views from Twitter itself because you know, he loves his Twitter. But, uh, and because people have access to that, they can see how um, the news reporters just blatantly lie about it. It's just so much easier now to see mm -hmm. that we can't trust the media because we can see what Donald Trump said and then we just see how the news people twist it. Uh, twist it. And because yeah. we have that side-by-side -side comparison, we've just, lo across the board, just lost a trust in the mainstream media. Right. And I think no more excellent example than what we saw this week with Cyril Ramaphosa um, with the damage control we've seen from News24 and his uh, apparently his new PR manager, Peter de Toy. Um, it seems to me that people can now just like you said, they can access the clip for themselves. They can see what he said. And now afterwards, when people are outraged about him, so, so for, for context for people listening in that don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, this week on an international platform, our president, uh, Sir Ramaphosa, when asked about Donald Trump's tweet about farm murders and land grabs in South Africa, said that no land grabs are happening and there are no, there's no murdering of white farmers or farmers in South Africa, which I found absolutely shocking. Um, it's, I mean, like I've always said on the show, I'm not a, a proponent or a, a preacher of white genocide. I just believe there's a farm murder epidemic and... I mean, the numbers are debatable. That's fine. That's fair. 
but to completely disregard it and say nothing is happening. I mean, that's why I always do the consistency test where I ask you if, yes, a lot of people agree that the people exaggerating the farm murder numbers are evil, bad propagandists. Okay, fine. But what, is, what does that mean? Or what is, what is your view then of people that say that downplay the farm murder epidemic and say there's nothing happening? I mean, that's equally bad if you're being consistent. So I think that that's an excellent example of that, what you just mentioned, where people can now see for themselves. They don't need the media to clarify what someone said, and the media still are lagging behind. Even after some outrage about what he said, um, the next day, Peter de Toy, the second in command of News24, went on, I can't remember where, but he also did an interview and a bunch of tweets where he said, okay, so the actual words of what he said was this, but this is what he really meant with like a little asterisk. And people don't buy that anymore. They say, no, um, Cyril Ramaphosa is not a bad speaker. He's not a, his English is excellent. He definitely didn't misspeak. Um, he, this was, uh, uh, according to what we can see, and by all indications, a lie, just for PR and uh getting some favor with the international community, not uh, acknowledging a crisis in South Africa. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm in full agreement that it's that new connection that we have with our audiences. And that kind of segues me into my other point about uh, the attractiveness of alternative media. I'm looking at the chat right now and I can see what the people tuning in are saying at this very moment. And I can respond to them and they can see that I'm a real person. And that, <laughs> I always tell people there's no difference between me and them. I'm I'm just the guy with the with the microphone and the channel. I mean, anyone listening in can do what I do. I don't I don't have a journalism degree. I don't have any anything that makes me special. I just took the initiative, and I don't see myself as as better than my audience. I think the majority of people in the chat are probably smarter than me. But yeah, so I think that that's something that that gives the, the alternative media its charm is the fact that we actually have real interaction with our audiences. We're not just this corporate entity. There's a realness to us. There's a humanity to us almost. Uh, yeah. So if you have any comments on that, yeah. It actually it's interesting that you say it's that we, it makes that we're not co corporate entity, because a lot of uh, opponents of rational standard when they're trying to say uh, uh, delegitimize us will often act as if we're uh, owned by some big media house. And then we'll promptly respond, we wish, like then we could act, this would be a hang of a lot easier if we were, did have that sort of money. Um, especially they accuse us of being owned by the Koch brothers, <laughs> which uh, we wouldn't mind, to be completely honest. <laughs> we might mm. think, we, when we say independent, we don't mean that we don't, that doesn't mean we um, don't want to be owned by some rich guy. It just means we don't want them influencing what we publish and what we write. Mm. Um, if they're going to give us free money, you know, I'm fine with that. <laughs> um, and also, uh, uh, for, uh, based on your one comment, when you said you don't have a journalism degree, that already actually, in my opinion, puts you far above most journalists in this country. Knowing where journalism degrees come from in South Africa, from Rhodes University, or as I should know, the university currently known as Rhodes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's actually, um, it, it, if you follow the actual paper trail, where our journalists come from, it starts actually becoming scarier and scarier that they're the ones who dictate the airwaves. And if you see what they're being taught at university and what um, their lecturers believe constitutes journalism, it's, you start understanding why we're in this mess. Mm. It's, um, uh, well, f uh, funny aside, one of our rational science claim to fame is one of the professors of journal uh, journalism cited us as the right wing nut jobs, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> That's where the title came from. But I'm not uh, so. Did any of you uh, have you read an article published? I'm trying to remember one or two years ago by Mark Oppenheimer on the site, and it was in response to um, some just uh, uh, unforgivable behavior by the Rhodes uh, Journalism faculty uh, during an open event where they were discussing free speech. And he was basically just sh shut down because of his surname, Oppenheimer, and also because of the color of his skin, and also because of his gender, you know, the whole intersectional nonsense. And this co is coming from a profession that is supposed to represent the height of freedom of speech. 
and the entire faculty, which is the leading journalism faculty in South Africa, if not the whole of Africa, is teaching that freedom of speech is racist and that it's bad and it's elitist and it's white. And to tell these people who defend free speech to sit down because of the color of their skin and because they're apparently privileged, which um, Professor David Benneter quite succinctly put out, if, a, if white privilege makes it that you aren't allowed to speak, you don't have privilege. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, just to avoid the rant, <laughs> I'll stop right. on that now. <laughs> Yeah, but that's that's and that's why I call this the stream the absolute state of the South African media because that's what we're dealing with. And but now my question would be: uh, Do you think the South African media is particularly unbalanced, or is this a global phenomenon? So it's um, so I read um, some news news uh, sites from around the world. Uh, world. So I see a lot of Asian stuff, which actually the Asian sites tend to be really quite right wing or centrist. So I wouldn't say it's global, but I would say it is the left tends to dominate in the UK, Western Europe, America, and in South Africa, because South Africa, as much as our government might like to pretend otherwise, is a very is very dominated by the Western hegemony. We have a very uh, we're influenced by Western media, and we're influenced by Hollywood. We all grew up watching Hollywood films. We grew up watching Disney. We grew up. Um, uh, uh, with American news, the fact that we actually care about things like 9-11 and the Trump presidency shows how westernized and dominated by America we are. But that's also why we tend to mirror their situation. So I would say that journalism in general, the mainstream journalism that is, is dominated by left-wing outlets. And But I would also say that America has the, I would like to say, <laughs> privilege of having a lot of people who still remember a culture of freedom and defiance. So that's why they have quite a strong alternative media and quite a strong um, libertarian undertones in their society. And that's something that South mm. Africa doesn't have. South Africa has, from all sides, has a leg historical legacy of authoritarianism. We have, on among the um, black South Africans, we have tribalism and we have a romantic, uh, romantic love of socialism. And among the Afrikaners, we have, well, socialism as well. In fact, in, if you're not familiar with the Rand Revolt, I right. suggest that you give uh, just Google it. It's based, to be succinct, the forerun of the National Party um, were members of a an attempted communist revolution in South Africa called the Rand Revolt. And then they... In a merger, they basically formed the National Party. So the National Party that loves to talk about you know fighting communism is a communist party. Uh, sounds awfully familiar to the Nazi Party in that degree. Socialists pretending they don't like socialists. But um, uh, I, so the only actual demographic in South Africa which actually has any sort of, I would say, they haven't been infected with any sort of cultural, culturally authoritarian ideas, is the English white community. But at the same time, the English white community is so apathetic that I would say that they don't have any sort of uh, latent ideology. So they uh, end up just to interject, I'm just going to go uh, turn off the light outside. Keep on, uh, keep talking about that. Just uh, Oof, two pressure. minutes. So. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's just that. Uh, yeah. So the English white community is very uh, is uh, very apathetic, and I think it's that apathy that has made a lot of them have ended up becoming SJWs. But at the same time, it's not exclusive. All demographics are falling to social justice. But I would say that's mostly because of the power of universities and the power of media over them. We, we, so there's a very good essay by Frederick von Hayek called The Intellectuals and Socialism that basically talks about how the socialists back then were planning on taking over the... Um, taking over the... Um, well, basically everything. And the way they were going to do it was by taking over universities. Because even if, yeah, so uh, I'm just looking at the comments. Yeah, I'm also English, so I'm allowed to insult myself. Yeah, I'm back, by the way, so that you don't have to, to keep them entertained all by your But yeah, yeah, continue. Um, what was I saying? When I was distracted by someone saying I'm English. They're talking so about the, the takeover of the universities. Yes, yes, thank you. So, 
everyone is has to be taught something somewhere along the line. Uh, Keynes said that no matter how independent someone thinks, so I'm paraphrasing heavily, everyone has been influ is uh, been influenced by some long dead philosopher somewhere along the line. There's mm -hmm. another way of quote, uh, saying it is there's nothing new under the sun. But you, the essence then of taking over society is learning where do people get their knowledge and what convinces people to become something. And every, somewhere along the line, it comes from the academy, the uh, universities, the campuses where the ideas are formed. And the problem worldwide, especially in the West, because of uh, we've been in universities the longest of all other societies, and also in South Africa because of historical context has ended up do uh, certain ideologies have dominated our universities more than others. Our universities have been taken over by left-wing thinkers, um, Keynesians in the econo economics department, if you don't, uh, and that's a lesser evil compared to Marxists, arguably, hmm. not even sure actually. And um, then uh, Marxists in the politics department, uh, we're lucky in U UCT that the philosophy department's still pretty good. And um, it's basically that if you take over the academy, you start taking over the minds of the students going through the academy. Those students are going to become journalists, they're going to become politicians, they're going to become lawyers, they're going to become parents, and parents can be some of the most dangerous, and probably the most dangerous, they're going to become teachers. Right. And when they're actually able to, yeah, I'm, the face, the fellow Englishman, I have also become a new <laughs> Afroforum member. <laughs> I need to, so yeah, we are the same here. I think that honestly, any, everyone in this country should be joining Afroforum if they're a decent member of society. You can read my article on it's on the Rational Standard, where I, um, I where I say I'm not a joiner. I, I seldom join anything. The last thing I joined, um, besides guilds and online games, I don't even join those actually, uh, was uh, I joined the DA when I was in junior high school, and then I promptly left it because they terrible, terrible people. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, uh, we've had a we've had a, uh, some big developments after Aaron Zaruts's parliament speech in terms of DA disillusionment amongst mm -hmm. the the Afri Forum member uh, almost like overlapping uh, constituency because that's something that I that I found very odd is the DA all they had to do was not comment on if they really wanted to just play the PR game or the the pandering game don't don't comment on it just leave him and let him speak his mind but then afterwards something really funny happened they went uh, and not and in parliament and then afterwards on social media the da decided uh, i think it was, it was a huge blunder they decided to go out of their way to distance themselves from adam's roots and say things like for example the mp in parliament said that she agreed with and i quote nothing that he said so therefore she quite technically without being too petty <laughs> agrees with uh, ewc and at the same time then more mps came out and the infamous one uh, the van dam one uh, that's the shadow minister of communications that has blocked almost half of the da constituents on twitter Actually, um, also, yeah also <laughs> also came out and said that everything Aaron said was manure and then another mp i can't remember her name a smaller one also came out and uh, made like a string of 20 tweets against Aaron Zaruts. And I just found it despicable. After seeing how he was treated in parliament and how he was treated by especially the DA afterwards as well, and by the ACDP in parliament as well, I just realized that next day I joined Afri Forum and I screenshotted my confirmation message that I got and I tweeted it. And then I actually inspired a lot of other people to do the same. I think I saw like at least a dozen people also post their screenshots of their confirmation messages and it's actually quite amazing to see mm. and yeah and it's not about it's not a, a uh, an africana nationalism thing for me it's about standing up for what is right and siding with the people that are standing up for property rights in this country because they're so rare yeah to actually link that to the main topic of the live stream the uh, afroforum is possibly the most demonized and unfairly demonized um organization in this country and the media just with almost without any real genuine justification just attacks it as some sort of just trendy game it's something that you just have to do like breathing or just drinking so you don't perspire when well, no, don't expire <laughs> and it shows the triumph of alternative media and the defeat of this dishonest media 
that people are actually still siding with Afroforum. And not only people who would be described as white or Afrikaans. I see people of all race groups are realizing that Afroforum is a decent organization and has done a hang of a lot more po positively to help this um uh, to help this country and the people in this country than most of our political parties. In fact, it goes much more than the... Honestly, I actually have to say, because of my... I like facts, that the ANC has possibly done more. Not necessarily good in the long run. But just on paper, they have done more in terms of electrification, access to healthcare and stuff like that. But then, yeah, now that's all falling apart. So <laughs> wait a few more minutes and then the Afroforum will have done the most. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting observation. It's for me, and I mentioned this when I went on Ronaldo Jose's show to talk about farm murders, kind of links in with that. And I said the, the biggest, un, the most unfairly and most vigorously and viciously opposed cause in this country, to me it seems, is the, the campaign to bring attention to farm murders. And then the most viciously opposed uh, NGO in this country is AfriForum. And it just stems for me from uh, ideological bias. The idea of AfriForum, it's like you said, the cool thing to do. It's what you do. It's AfriForum is public enemy number one. Mm -hmm. And this actually links up to a, a segue that I want to, to discuss, and that's the, the sensationalism of the media. And so uh, you probably saw uh, last week the poll data that came out from the Institute of Race Relations mm -hmm. about the, the party polling, about how they've grown in support. Well, some parties and some parties have declined. And the interesting thing for me from that data was the EFSF's double, doubling of their support. And I made a video on this a few days ago, or yesterday, yeah, a video on the media's complicity in this uh, growth of the EFF. Because what they do is, because they, they need sensationalism, they need clicks, they need uh, drama, they need something to pull people in a hook. And the EFF are the perfect, perfect candidates to give them all these catchy headlines like, oh, the EFF came out in Heritage Day and said we need to take out the stem out of the national anthem. Oh, yes, that's going to be a great headline. People are going to be so outraged by that. And there is 6%, a party of 6% support, but they get such immense publicity from the media. I mean, they're the absolute darlings of the media. And then at the same time, the media want to then find a right-wing equivalent because they want to show that they're not biased towards the left radicals. They want to show, oh, we also, we also demonize the right-wing radicals, but they can't find any that have the any right-wing uh, uh, right wing equivalent of the EFF or BRF that have any power in this country. So now they had, they're forced to frame AfriForum as such. Uh, if they can't do that, then their whole kind of, their whole narrative falls apart, showing the, the bias that they have for the left-wing radicals and these fluff pieces that they write on them. And that's what I'm saying. I think the, the media's wet dream, to put it that way, to put it bluntly, is that AfriForum become more radical, that AfriForum become exactly what they paint them to be. That would be their Christmas. That would be their payday, because then they would have infinite... Uh, headlines to write and everything would be based on facts and they would actually be substantiated. So they'd be able to firstly retain their reputation as uh, non-biased and uh, based on facts and whatever and they will also be able to bash AfriForum which would be a win-win for them. So that's what I'm saying. Their biggest frustration and why they are so uh, why they despise AfriForum so much is that AfriForum do not conform to their idea of what they want to paint AfriForum to be. And I think that drives them up the walls. Yeah. It's, um, so I just got distracted by some more text. The, uh, I should actually close down the text. It's too distracting. <laughs> the, uh, it's actually, the, uh, what's sad for the media, though, is that Afroform is not going to do that. They're not going to become the big radical boogie, bo boogeyman that they want them to be. And this is why the media so blatantly lies about it all the time and keeps putting words into Afroform's mouth. Um, just constantly, because Afroforum doesn't care about actually overthrowing the country, so to speak, the way that a lot of people would want to think that they are. They'd like to view them as the new Avi Beer. That what Afroforum's tactic is, is basically creating a peaceful alternative to where the government has failed, mm. and they're succeeding. And they're basically just doing what any private sector will do. They're just doing it to a less traditional industry, <laughs> Because in many other parts of the world, the government tends to know it tends to finish at something as basic as putting concrete on the ground. 
but you know, <laughs> asking a little bit too much in South Africa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Um, there's something I did uh, notice and I uh, brought it up in my video, the idea of how in order to survive, so I don't think it's an open secret that the mainstream media or at least the traditional form of media is dying. Print media, the whole TV, television, 24-hour news broadcasting format is dying. It's not growing. And they're becoming more desperate, more sensationalist. But in order to keep themselves relevant, they've, and not just in South Africa, but in the South African context, it's taken a very unique form. They've created a moral panic uh, akin to the satanic panic and reds under the bed of uh, yesteryear. So they've convinced the South African populace that there's this growing far right within the country that want to bring back apartheid, that want to uh, just uh, take the country back into an authoritarian white rule. And a lot of people eat this up. So then they start panicking and they start supporting because there's a moral panic. They start supporting the more far right, uh, far left parties because that will balance out this, this apparent growing far right. And the EFF have pounced on this moral panic being created by the media by just coming forward and, and presenting themselves as the cure. And I think this is something we're seeing, uh, not just in South Africa, but we're seeing this from one side in South Africa. In the rest of the world, it's the cannibalization of the center. So what you're seeing is the media are playing up all these uh, Nazis and far right, alt right, whatever buzzword you want to use, white supremacists on the right. And they say, look at these. And then the, le the far left say, look at all these Nazis. Look at all these white supremacists. They're coming to kill you. Come to our side. We'll keep you safe. And then a uh, little bit of the center gets chipped away and goes to the far left just to be safe. And then the far right in foreign countries pounces on this as well. And they say, look at all these Antifa thugs. Look at all these communists. They're coming to kill you. Come to our side. We'll keep you safe. And then a little bit more of the center gets chipped away. Mm. But this is the, the trend in, in foreign in Europe and in America. But in South Africa, it's pretty much a one-way street from my, from my view because the media is so unbalanced. So the, the far left have a much bigger platform for their come to our side, we'll keep you safe message that we're actually seeing a lot more of the center uh, in terms of uh, the, the the voting electorate being more sympathetic to far left views because the media have created this this boogeyman of uh, apartheid apologists that are coming bringing apartheid back and are coming to lynch you or whatever and it's 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 troubling but uh, what are your thoughts on that theory yeah so it's definitely the media has a lot to answer for and they um I think that when they, the reason that the EFF has benefited from so much is not only that they that the, they're you know nice to talk about and the media they get clicks because they definitely do and that's what the media wants they need that ad money, which because they desperate they as an aside just explain how many, how much dire straits um, the media is in at the moment. So News Twenty Four, which is the largest online media site in South Africa, is currently in heavy debt. Um, NAS, uh, Media 24, which is owned by uh, NAS Burst, which is ironically what everyone keeps referring to as one of the white monopoly capital organizations, yet they generate, they own some of the most left-wing, anti-white media how, uh, uh, media sites in South Africa. Uh, Huffington Post and News 24 is just to name two of them. Um, it, it hasn't turned any sort of profit. It's just basically all of NAS Burst's other assets are just being used to prop it up. Because uh, journalism journalism's become kind of a vanity game. It doesn't make money. I can say this like mm. completely as someone who <laughs> um, co-owns a media thing. It doesn't make money. If you're not Facebook and you're not Google and you're not Amazon, you can't make money out of advertising anymore. Um, it's uh, the only way to make money out of media now is subscription services, and nobody wants to do that. Like I don't mm. want to do it. Um, so um, what ends up happening is that you get uh, patrons. Uh, so what happens is that um, think tanks who have a uh, lot of money due to uh, donors and due to trusts, um, they will fund certain uh, uh, certain websites, and those websites will then be the editorial guidelines will be informed by the organization that owns them, and. Um, it's actually fine if they're honest about it. Like there's uh, one site, Politics Web, is owned by a classical liberal um, think tank. But the difference is that I actually think they're not biased enough. 
it is actually a lot of stuff <laughs> that I wouldn't because uh, it I'm actually. A, they're you know, my favorite media outlet at the moment. To put my bias out there, I think they're doing excellent work. Oh no, they are doing excellent work now, and also, especially seeing that it's run by one guy. Um, Yo, I don't know that. Yeah, so it's his full time job though. So he's, uh, when if if rational standard was my full time job, it would be fine, but. <laughs> It's not. I have to juggle it with other things that to in order to survive. It's uh, my problem with politics web though is I think they give a. Uh, um, it's actually what you're saying earlier is that the left owns the platform at the moment. So the big thing is is that if you're going to make a platform, it's expensive to maintain a platform. It takes a lot of right. effort. Why would you give that platform to someone you don't like? And I can understand there's a place for it, but. It's not, but you don't have to just give it uh, give it to them on a silver platter. Is Daily Vox going to let ra a rational standard writer write a defense of the free market on their site? No, they're not. <laughs> Is the Black Opinions going to let you? No, they're not. Um, yeah. The only, uh, it's like News Twenty Four used to, but not not as much anymore. The only mainstream sites that actually still allow um, right leaning opinions would be uh, Business Day, My Broadband, Business Tech, things by the TSO Black Star Group. Those are like the only decent uh, mainstream media houses still left in South Africa. Um, but yeah, I think that you're completely right. It's, the media wants to be sensationalist because they're desperate to get uh, views. But even then, it's, the views don't make them that much money. So you have to think, it's not even about the money anymore. Is it just pure vanity? It's just a vanity project, yeah. yeah. And something I, I realized in the, in the past week that's very, very telling is News24, when you click on one of their articles and you have an ad blocker on, the whole article freezes and a big screen comes up and says, please disable your ad blocker or become a, a, a patron and you can read our articles. I'm like, okay, goodbye to News24. I'll get yeah. the I'll get my news from somewhere else. Yeah, it's actually, it's been good because uh, News24 is convenient. This is why I would read it for so long, even though I don't, I don't trust them. And I'll give good reason why I don't trust them in a sec. Um, but because they have short articles and they're constantly reporting on things, because they have a lot of journalists and a, a lot of investigators, it's the best place to get the news the fastest. The reason why I shouldn't trust them, uh, do you remember when um, our glorious previous president, Jacob Zuma, uh, was doing the cab uh, his, I think it was his final cabinet reshuffle, which was the one before that. It was the one where he um, kicked out um, Pravin Gordon. And... Uh, so, uh, Six hours before the actual announcement of the cab uh, of the new cabinet positions, News Twenty Four and Mail and Guardian published not what they thought were going to be the cabinet uh, the new cabinet positions. They published what stating this these are the new ministers, and they, obviously they got it wrong because they they're not privy to the room. But they be they were so desperate to get view uh, views that they just blatantly lied that they knew what was going on. Mm. They, uh, uh, Mail and Guardian actually apologized. News Twenty Four didn't do anything because <laughs> um, like, Mail Guardian just had the headline Pravin Gordon no longer finance minister and I'm like okay we know in hindsight yeah that's true but you don't know that six hours before they even announce the uh, announce it mm, yeah it's irresponsible uh, and that's the thing that I also want to bring up is now that we're speaking about the the dire state of in terms of who can you trust who who in the South African media gets your endorsement? If you just could name two outlets that you uh, accept politics web, um, that you do think just at least do a decent job. And I'm am I not allowed to mention National Standard? <laughs> no, uh, politics web and National Standard, Rational Standard are out. Okay, uh, Business Day and My Broadband. Okay. Yeah. Because that's a question I get a lot from people that follow me and people that tune into my shows. They re they ask me. Well, they ask me two questions. The first question that always comes up is. Uh, who should we vote for in 2019? And the second question that always comes up is who, uh, what media outlets should we trust? And it's uh, it's nice to always get some some suggestions from from level-headed people to just say, okay, these people are doing at least a decent job. You can give them a give them a read. I see here politics unhinged in the chat says Marula Media. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Marula Media's only problem is they only post in Afrikaans, so yeah. they they're only for Afrikaans um, audience. But yeah, no, they also do a decent job. Uh, they oh. they do take a little bit of an, a shotgun approach, where they write articles on absolutely everything. But uh, no, they're decent. Yeah, the Afrikaans media. I uh, my Afrikaans is terrible, so <laughs> I'll I'll accuse the Afrikaans of having the privilege of actually having a media which is halfway decent. Mm. Um, the English media. But the is also good. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's um i think what group owns them besides Mar uh, uh, there's marilla media and what are the other afrikaans groups uh sure dude you're putting me on the spot here dude i, I don't really know that's <laughs> like, uh, it out of my ass. i had to um remind myself who owned business day a few seconds ago yeah, uh, the, the thinker here says in, in the chat, uh, if you if you can read Afrikaans, Rapport is all right. And Valdemar Pelser is a decent bloke. Yes, I completely agree. Valdemar Pelser gets the, the caracal seal of approval. Yeah. Mm. I think um, the sites that tend to do well are actually the ones which you wouldn't expect to be doing news at all, which are niche websites, things like industry news, so like engineering news. And you actually mm. find that you don't expect it to have you know broad news because of that they tend to actually do quite semi unbiased because um let's say an engineer has to report on some social scientific uh, topic you know for this because maybe it affects engineers in some way because they're an engineer they tend to actually genuinely have no real opinion on the matter right. um which really helps and it's maybe one of the reasons why my broadband does so well my broadband at business tech is that they're aimed as an IT uh, audience, but they do a hang of a lot of reports on politics and economics and all that. And I really good reports. I really mm. enjoy reading this stuff. It's one of the mm. few newsletters which I actually open up. Mm. So before I, I go into the next uh, topic or next question, uh, I just want to remind the chat, please uh, smash that like button. Let's see if we can get to 30 and start posting your questions for uh, Nicholas here, the co-founder of the Rational Standard. If you have any questions relating to the South African media or even his media outlet, and remember to tag me in the question so I don't miss your question in the chat. So now after that, uh, I'd also like to get your opinion on, are there any foreign media outlets that you pretty much are in, hold in high esteem or think are doing a sterling job? So I've been kind of out of it recently, so I can't. So don't judge me if they've done something within the last few weeks that just completely mm -hmm. destroys them. Mm. I actually quite like uh, the Wall Street Journal. Okay. Makes me sound like a big ultra capitalist. <laughs> well, I am. So <laughs> uh, the Wall Street Journal tends to have quite high quality stuff. They, of course, they have bad things. I think all except that hit piece they did on PewDiePie was absolutely disgusting. Oh no, it was terrible. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> that was uh, unforgivable. Um, the Economist tends to have quite a lot of good articles. They do have some really terrible ones, but um, I tend to like quite a lot of the stuff that they put out. But I think in general, there's a huge problem in um, in media. Uh, ironically, actually, um, so Russian media houses tend to do actually semi well when they're not talking about Russian affairs. I think mm. it's actually a very good thing if you want to. You should read news, foreign news about your own country. Just to, because you don't get that local uh, bias coming through, mm. but you will get their foreign bias coming. Through, That's why I've always been there. reading. Uh, I've always been tuned into Russia Today because they were one of the few media outlets that has a, a more anti-Western perspective, but they're not Al Jazeera. Yeah. So <laughs> I actually, if I want to get some some perspectives on American foreign policy, I always go to Russia Today for a perspective, just to get some some bit of a contrarian view. Because that's the thing about the American media; it's, it's very hard to find a, a an objective account of American foreign policy in their media. So Russia Today definitely is uh, one of the perspectives I go to, just for a bit of a contrarian flair. Uh, actually, on the topic of foreign policy, uh, the the website Foreign Policy is actually also very good. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's. I think they also have like a publication, but I only use the mm. website. Uh, I'm only yeah. thinking of Foreign Affairs now, which is also a, a journal. Yeah, yeah. but uh, they also did a very good piece on Venezuela, where they interviewed this the former, I think the the Minister of Economics or something. I can't exactly remember what his role was, but yeah, he um, he said the the big condemning thing about Venezuela is people always ask him. How did it get so bad? How did we get um, to a point where a large portions of the population and even the international community were duped into thinking that um, Hugo Chavez, not Maduro's, uh, actual policies would make a positive difference and that they were progressive? And his answer was he worked for, he worked under Maduro, I think. Yeah. Well, no, no, he worked under Chavez. I'm talking, uh, no, I mixed up the two names. Actually, Maduro is the big. Uh, the big culprit in their current problems. But yeah, uh, he worked under Chavez and he said the big uh, problem and the big reason why so many people fell for his rhetoric was because he convinced the international academics, journalists and 
politicians that it would work and they just um uh, put their the minds of their constituencies at ease saying oh look at this marvelous sterling job that this man is doing we should follow these models and i'm seeing a lot of it in terms of south africa as well where they buy all this propaganda and they buy into all these fairy tale stories and you can't help but want it to succeed i mean shit, dude if if all the promises we were given in 1994 could just materialize right now, yo, dude, I don't think anyone would be against it. I think the majority of people want that promise of the country or the pro the country that we were promised to materialize. I think a very few people would come against it. I myself, I wish that all those promises came true. But now we're seeing the cracks in the policy because it's very idealistic. But at the same time, the key point that I want to get back to is that what he mentioned where who are the main culprits and why people were so easily duped and it was the the academics and the press that fell for all these fairy tales and they didn't look at it critically yeah well take there's a it takes an academic to be that stupid it's um yeah you sound fine yeah i hear you man sorry it sound like you cut out for a second um no, I'm good yeah, no, it's uh, actually links back to what I mentioned earlier, the uh, Hayek's uh, essay, The Intellectual and Socialism. So if you want to change a society, you take over the a a academy. And academics, and I can see this being a recently graduated student and then going back into the quagmire next year, it's uh, uh, it, it, academics are not smart people. <laughs> and they, it, it, they, so, they don't understand how the real world works. They're so have the heads shoved up their own ass that they've become blinkered at least uh, if someone's blinkered at least they can see ahead of them these guys can't even see that there's plenty of good academics but the problem is that they're far outnumbered by the number of bad academics but the reason they're bad academics and this is my bias is coming through is because they have been captured by these ideologies and the thing is it'd be fine like as a liberal i would say okay and it's good to have a lot of ideologies competing but the problem is these are ideologies that are winning and when they win so a lot of people die and it's why it's become less and less able to tolerate socialists and communists in our academic circles now mm. just, uh, just so i can add an aside that doesn't mean we throw them out of helicopters what it does mean though <laughs> hey i'll be... challenge you on that <laughs> well yeah uh, no, I, I can't say this is awesome meme, it's being recorded there's this meme uh, that one of my mates sent me today where there's like this this guy asks you so um should we throw communists out of helicopters then he replies the law requires me to answer no <laughs> <laughs> well that's a, a basic what i've just said <laughs> the um but the, what i do mean though is that liberals need to actually grow more of a backbone and just any listeners who might misunderstand when i say liberal i'm referring to the european brand of liberalism so their definition of liberalism which is the right mm -hmm. uh, right because american english is corrupt and doesn't know what they're talking about um where it's basically um individualism free markets civil rights like freedom of speech you know essential right rule of law stuff like that liberalism in america doesn't mean anything it doesn't have an actual meaning it basically just refers no. to anyone who's a member of the democrats that's not a definition so no. I, I just reject the american definition of liberalism because yeah. it's so hollow um yeah we actually i actually had a, a debate with a guy on on twitter the other day where he said i can't believe you and this was actually in reference to uh you coming on the show and he's like uh, i'm not i don't have time for liberals they they're all communists and i said well dude you're looking at it from a very Americanized lens. In the rest of the world, in the sane world, we actually know what liberal stands for. It actually stands for a lot more, and actually it stands for the antithesis of the Democratic Party in America. I mean, if if you support free speech, if you support the indiv the rights of the individual, if you support property rights, I hate to break it, you're, you're, you're pretty liberal in your views. And in fact, the essential parts of it, if you look at the Republican Party and just ignore their more, you know, near um, near conservative and um, more conser and more like theocratic part of it, it's a classical liberal organization. It's uh, there. Uh, if you're a constitutionalist in America, you're a classical liberal. It's hmm. uh, um, and luckily, a lot of Americans, if you go into a higher circle. So yeah, if you go to a higher strata of political discussion, people will acknowledge that and you will have people saying, well, I am a classical liberal and they'll mean it properly. And mm. that's why we have to say classical liberal because otherwise people get really confused about it. But you can, there's an argument to be made that there's only one type of liberal. Mm. 
but then I'll be accused of being way too <laughs> fanatical. And then right. I have to provide nuance as well. So nuance can be fun. It's very fun discussing yeah. different types of liberalism and why most of them are wrong. <laughs> yeah. I saw this cartoon on, on Twitter also the other day where this guy goes up to like a, a guru and he asks him, like, I'm, I keep losing my debates. Do you have any magical items that I can use to just decimate my opponents? And he takes out this grenade and he's like, take this. This is called semantics. <laughs> debating the words the, the the meaning of very trivial words and everyone knows what it means but you're just like so what does this really mean what do you mean by believe what do you mean by support and yeah no i've i've actually encountered this quite a few times when i'm when i'm debating people yeah. and yeah so i said we're gonna answer some questions from the chat uh, i got a question here from eddie liebenberg he asks uh, what is your opinion on infowars and alex jones oh it's a spicy question eddie thanks man i think they're very amusing I think uh, Alex Jones is a very, very good showman. I, th I honestly do think he's actually acting most of it. I think he knows how to get views. He knows how to make money. Mm -hmm. I don't now. Obviously, I think it should go without saying, but I'll say it anyway. That I don't think Infowars or Alex Jones should have been censored in any way. I think that they shouldn't have been kicked off social media. It was just stupid, and there was some st a moderator just uh, um, on social media thinking they're going to save the world. Um, I don't like a lot of Alex Jones' views. Mm. I think he's a. I'm going to say something that a lot of sort of mainstream media would probably say. I do think he's a nut job, a proper nut job. <laughs> but also at the same time, I don't think he actually believes what he's saying. Yeah, that's why we disagree. I think he's perfectly sane. I think he's just he embodies what it means to be infotainment, and yeah, I think exactly. his whole his whole act, his whole stick is why he's popular. I mean, of he course. says outlandish things to get people to tune in. I mean. Everyone in the chat and probably you as, as well have seen or encountered the the gay frogs meme. Yes, and I mean he's a living just, meme. And that's that's just an example where he takes a very outlandish statement and then it goes viral and people people fall for the fact that he, they think he actually believes it and then they start spreading it out and look at this nut job, look at this crazy person and then a lot of people tune in because they want to listen to the crazy guy. And that's actually what I did was when I listened to the, when I watched the, the presidential debates in 2016, Infowars was doing a, a live stream of the debates with side commentary. I was like, fuck yes, I'm going to listen to this. Much better than just listening to the debate itself. I want to listen to the debate with Alex Jones right there giving commentary on like the lizard people and the how Hillary is exhibiting demon traits. I mean, that was absolutely entertaining. And Politics Unhinged asked at Rational Standard, are you aware of the state of free speech in the UK? And he's probably referring to um, Tommy Robinson. So now, uh, UK politics, I haven't been well versed for the last few months on that. Mm. So if you, but I do know that it has been suffering. Yeah, um, well, I could probably, I've been pretty in tune with it. Yes, uh, Politics Unhinged, uh, I do think there's a, I mean, you just have to look at the meme for, oi, bro, if you got a license for that joke, yeah. And I mean, that's where the UK is going. They're pretty authoritarian in their in their free speech. And I get so many messages from people in the UK where I see where they say, you Americans are so lucky that you have the First Amendment. Yeah. But at the same time, then you have leftists in the American media that try to absolutely destroy that right. And I see here another question directed at me. Mirkat RSA asks, what do you think of the Discord media shitstorm? Uh, Mirkat, I'm not going to say a lot about it. I think it's a nothing burger smear piece. Uh, I think it's despicable. I don't, I'm not even going to give them the time of day. Um, yeah, I think it's just the, the essence of the sensationalist media that would rather go after people by labeling them all kinds of shit. I think to answer your question, I can actually go into a topic I wanted to discuss as well. So Lindsay Marstorp of BLF went on Ronaldo Gose's show. And on the show, he he basically made the, and I'm paraphrasing, he made the 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 assertion that if there was a black rapist that raped white women, he would support him nonetheless. And um, then Ronaldo was absolutely shocked that he would say such a thing. I mean, a, a member of a, a member of parliament. And then he took that clip, and Ronaldo tweeted it out and tagged all these media outlets. To see if they would react in the same way that they did when some i can't even remember his name some racist bloke on a beach somewhere says mm -hmm. some vile shit. i mean they absolutely lost their minds about that but here's a, a member of blf saying something equally vile and there's not a peep from the media so yeah um Mirkat in a in short 
I don't really care about that nothing burger smear piece. I'll see where it goes, but at the moment, I don't really have a lot to say. It's a bit beneath me. Uh, there was another question I saw. Uh, <laughs> no, Mirkat also just made a made a remark that chemicals in Coke makes your children alt-right. Yes, um, I'm afraid so, man. Mm. I actually, unironically, I saw, a, and this is where I, why I brought in the satanic panic, was we're living in another moral panic, as Stix X and Hammer put it. Um, I saw an article last year where they said, if your child listens to heavy metal, he's probably being radicalized by white supremacists. And that just, that just, the, I instant, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the satanic panic. So I know where this narrative goes and I know where it's coming from. A bunch of pull clutching soccer moms thinking that, oh no, uh, little Johan is listening to ACDC or he's listening to this far right propaganda and he's going to turn into a Nazi because he's listening to heavy metal. Um, if you see anyone propagating such theories, just tell them to stop clutching their poles and just remove that stick up their ass. Mm. Um, I saw another one here. Uh, what, so Politics Unhinged asks for me and Rational Standard, what would it take for the mainstream media to take a critical standard on government uh, such as Ramaphosa's lies on farm attacks and land grabs? That's an excellent question. Uh, now, before I uh, give it over to, to Nicholas, I'll just answer it br very briefly. I think the thing that we need is a more balanced media. You need to start supporting alternative media. So when, the, when you see the mainstream media spinning things and not giving an objective um, account of what's happening in reality, don't even click on their links. Rather go to a trusted alternative media source that, you, or that has a good record in your opinion and that hasn't lied to you yet. Uh, rather go to them, support them, and ha listen to what they have to say. But also, a fair warning, don't get lost in the, the, the alt-media hype in terms of just listening to alternative media. I mean, you have some pretty pretty despicable propagandists within the alternative media sphere as well. I'm not going to deny that. Yeah, like so my advice is standard. <laughs> yeah, no, stay away from those blokes. Uh, they're pretty radical right-wing nutjobs. But yeah, uh, Nicholas, do you have anything to answer to that question? Just to repeat it, so... He asks, uh, what would it take for the mainstream media to take a critical standard on government, such as Ram Ramaphosa's lies about farm attacks and land grabs? So uh, besides providing competition through alternative media, which I think is definitely important, I think it would require a complete overthrow in the ownership of who owns the mainstream media. Their entire editing, all the editors, and the, the problem is the infrastructure that generates them has been captured by left-wing ideologues and by corrupt politicians, to name one, uh, Iqbal Survey, who stole pensioners' money in order to buy independent and turn it into his own personal narcissistic um, rag. Th those people have to go. And before that, ha and they're not going to go because there is no money in media. So any decent person who wants to go in there is basically going in there purely on charity. And charity is very unsustainable. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just <laughs> someone just sent me a, a Guardian article that came out recently that said, Do you boast about your fitness? Watch out, you'll unavoidably become right wing. <laughs> and this is not a this is not a meme, this is an actual article, and yeah, it just yeah. fits in perfectly with what we were talking about. It's this it's a moral panic. People are absolutely pull clutching and just thinking like, oh shit, what's gonna radicalize my children? Like, yeah, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's actually good in the long run, though, for the anti-left, because most people are reasonable enough to see what the hell. Of course, I'm going to brag about my fitness. That's something that's built into being a human. You can't undo tens of thousands of years of evolution, um, mm. which requires fitness people to <laughs> brag about their fitness. Mm. And they're just going to push all the people who like doing that away. And that's what's happening. And it's as you mentioned earlier, the eating away the center. Hmm. But if you're not in the center like me, because I think the center is um, doesn't exist. CC um, Ronaldo. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, um, it's basically put. Hopefully, they just get pushed into the good part of the right wing, because there's definitely the bad part of the right wing, um, which, which are basically just socialists with better uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Uh, so I get a I got a remark here from Outlaw Radio. Uh, hey, Conscious Caracal, this is Bad Billy of Outlaw Radio out of the USA. I hope we can have a conversation either on your show or mine one day. What do you say? Uh, Bad Billy, check your DMs. Um, 
let's see here's another one uh, from politics unhinged man your your question game is lit tonight man he asks a uh, question directed at rational standard uh, given the solid arguments in your articles while well, flattering i have to ask uh, do you think expropriation without compensation will result in the amending of the constitution sure heavy question but i'll see what he can what he can dish up yeah, it's, well, it's more that the meaning of the Constitution will allow expropriation without compensation. Uh, you mm. can't, the Constitution at the moment, unless the Constitutional Court basically just ignores what's written down and lets the expropriation without compensation bill go through without amending the Constitution, mm. it is our last thing, legal infrastructure, which is defending us from expropriation. Um, if uh, at the moment, I th I'm not going to make any strong predictions. There's too many factors at play. But if the ANC and the EFF together create a two-thirds majority, it will uh, the, they will amend the constitution, mm. and after that, there'll be nothing start nothing from a legal perspective stopping expropriation without compensation. There's plenty of other things though, like the fact that there's no actual capacity to enforce it. We have South Africa does not have a military. Mm. Uh, we have a few guys with no no uh, ammo <laughs> for their guns and incurable <laughs> AIDS. Um, <laughs> Yo, I saw a video the other day of like an air show of a, a helicopter from the South African Defense Force landing, but such a hard landing. And then all these oaks just kind of like walk out of it, but they're falling around. One guy broke his ankles and it was, I shouldn't laugh, but like it, <laughs> it's just a testament to the state of the, the South African military. By the way, that'll be the next stream of consciousness from the creators of Absolute State of the Media, the Absolute State of the South African military. Send me some clips. No. So Mirkat RSA says, uh, state-owned media should not exist. It is propaganda plat uh, propaganda platform. Yes, I agree. Mm. Uh, someone else asked, um, where is it now? I lost it. Uh, okay, I can't remember who asked it, but I do have it in my memory. It said that could the rational standard become the... Oh, yeah, I know. It's Belleville Pete that asked. Could the rational standard become SA's Fox News? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> um, Fox News is pretty much, in my book, just as bad as any legacy corporate media. They just found a different niche. I mean, they're part of the dying industry. So I would hope that mm. the rational standard does not turn into that because they, they, they play their game well. They've they've kind of masqueraded as alternative media to a small to a, a small extent. But you have to realize they're part of the same machine. They're part of the same problem. They're also a symptom of what we've been discussing for the past hour. So I would hope that the rational standard don't become like Fox News. Uh, Nicholas, do you have anything to say to that, yeah. that observation? Well, the owner of Fox, uh, Murdoch, um, he basically destroyed media all around the world. When he started taking over and buying up media houses, it's like ideologically, I'm not actually opposed to him. Like he's no, um, he's not bad ideology ideologically. He's kind of quite free market leaning, and pretty good on that. But he knows how to make money, and in order to do that, he sacrificed all the central parts of good media houses. He's made it very. He's the guy who brought sensationalism into the media. He's the guy who turned all newspapers into tabloids. He's the guy who founded the tabloid industry, basically. Like before, mm -hmm. at the hand, it was quite small. Um, I would say, though, that if he offered us a hang of a lot of money, I'd probably take the money and then just start something <laughs> else. Because that's the thing about terms of media. If it gets knocked down, you just start it up again. Um, but it's uh, I wouldn't want to become Fox News, as you said. Also because I don't, uh, media is not worth expanding to that uh, uh, size anymore because there's just no money in it. Yeah. It has to remain small. The only reason the rational standard survives is because none of us are paid. It's all volunteer uh, volunteers, mm. and it's basically a passion project. Right, and yeah, uh, I can take full credit for pushing you over a thousand followers on Twitter. I think you should actually get someone to voluntarily just manage your Twitter account as well. I think it will help your your readership and getting your more traction. And yeah, we, this we leads me to my uh, to my question. Um, can you give us any numbers or any idea about how well you're doing at the moment? Uh, even if it's just like your Facebook likes or do you have any stats in terms of your site? I'm just going to go check now so I can get the exact number. Um, to you. Um, while you get that, I'll check out what's going on in the chat. Uh, mm. Could you ask your guest uh, what he thinks about Ramaphosa meeting Soros? Asked Luca. Um, I'm just made it. I just made a very simple tweet, and I saw that. I just said it's a funny world we live in. 
because it's <laughs> it's the it's the embodiment of all these conspiracy theories coming into the fore and you realize there i saw another meme the other day where it just says that moment when you realize your tinfoil hat wearing friend was right all along and yeah it's i honestly uh, like, did you even need to see him with soros it's like yeah. honestly compared to uh, he's such uh, he's hangs over such out and out communists like yeah. soros is terrible but like at least he's not that openly communist <laughs> yeah. rubber poser is basically supporting turning this country into soviet africa yeah it's i like, mean um soros is even banned from his home country so that should tell you enough <laughs> um yeah. yeah do you have those stats for us yeah, so we have over 12,000 oh yeah, 12, likes. Uh, Facebook uh, has a stupid thing where after you get over 1,000 likes, oh no, there, I've just had to go to the detail thing. We have 12, over 12,300 likes on Facebook. And uh, Twitter, you, you already mentioned over 1,000. Then our website stats, which I actually already have open for some reason, mm. uh, we tend to get around um, 30 to 40,000 people looking at our site per month. So that's just unique views. Mm. And um, I know from a quality of readership point of view that a lot of people from the J Joburg bar, um, the medical associations, um, universities, a lot of political parties um, and think tanks um, share our articles to each other, discuss that's them excellent. and like them. So you can actually, we get a lot of uh, traffic from um, lawyers who have written articles for Rational mm -hmm. Standard where they've um, put links to their articles on their like lawyer profiles. Mm, and that's then, very nice yeah cool no uh, those are some very very encouraging stats and i would just like to remind everyone tuning in you can go to the rational standards website link in the description there's also a link to nicholas's twitter you can give him a follow and there's also a, a link to rational standards uh unmanned twitter account at the moment so it's manned by a bot <laughs> <laughs> i'll i'll put in a link to their facebook page as well after the after the stream so yeah, um, I think I'm going to start winding down the stream now because I usually try to keep it at an hour and 15 minutes. So Nicholas, can you give us, and this was a uh, question in the chat as well, I can kind of tie it into your final remarks. Can you give us uh, just an overview of where, what do you think about the South African media at the moment and where do you see it going? And also then can you tie that into where South Africa is going to just uh, off the top of your head, what do you see in your crystal ball? So same response for South Africa and the media. It's terrible and it's getting worse. <laughs> uh, to substantiate that, I uh, the media is dominated by the left. There's no actual reasonable competition to replace it. Uh, podcasts like Renegade Report are excellent, but the people who desperately need to be listening to it can't listen to it. There's mm -hmm. no, uh, and as much as the alternative media can provide good competition, the people who desperately need to read the media are people who only have access to newspapers or only know about newspapers. Um, we're, uh, and in terms of South Africa, because the media is dominated by the left, it's only uh, uh, we're going to continually probably push towards down the road to serfdom. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Mm. Right. And do you have any concluding remarks in terms of what a message you'd like to send to everyone tuning in today? Well, personal plug read rational standard <laughs> and also if any of you are um writers or even if you uh, just have an idea rational standard publishes articles from almost everyone there is no such thing as someone who is not, not uh, writing is not that hard and i shouldn't be saying that because that's how i make my money <laughs> um if you have any ideas or any thoughts you want to put out there just go on our website there's details how to submit articles to us and we'll get them published, unless they're really terrible. That's excellent. Um, yeah, and my concluding remarks would be, thank you, Nicholas, for coming on. I am a big fan of the Rational Standard. It gets the Caracol seal of approval. And I would encourage everyone to go to the links in the description, uh, go check out for yourself. You can judge whether they are right-wing nuts or not. And I would just like to thank you for coming on, Nicholas. It was an excellent chat. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I would uh, be happy to come on your podcast if you ever do guests on the Rational Standard podcast. Uh, is there a link to? The, is it on a site? Where is this hosted? It's. Um, I'll get the. I'll send the link to you, so then you can add it to the description. Yeah, later. I'll put in the link in the description later. So just uh, orally, where can where can the people listening find it? 
iTunes. It's on iTunes. There you can listen to it straight on um, the thing called Pepper, which is what we use to distribute it to a number of different sources. I think the most popular would just be iTunes. So that's your best bet to just search cool. for it there. Right. And we do take it's basically built around guests, so I can introduce you to the guy who runs it. Okay, great, excellent. I will definitely come on, and I will also be in correspondence with Outlaw Radio. Uh, well done uh, for getting your getting the the host's attention. So um, thanks again for tuning in. There was an excellent conversation, and thanks again for everyone that tuned in to listen. Uh, we had a very nice uh, live audience tonight. We had a peak of forty five listening live, which is pretty good uh, for uh, no offense, someone that isn't like a huge. Uh, social media presence, even though the rational standard is slowly making a name for itself. Um, yeah, so I would just, my concluding remarks would be keep your newsfeed diversified. Don't get too lost in just alternative media. Keep keep subscribed to some of the, the mainstream media outlets just to see what's going on in their crazy heads. And always try and get as big a spread of perspectives on any story you want because the truth's never only going to come from one side. It's going to be somewhere in the middle probably leaning right mm -hmm. but yeah um thanks again everyone for tuning in i hope to see you tune in for the next stream of consciousness and thanks nicholas for coming on and giving us your time that was an excellent discussion cool thanks for having me right so good night guys leave a leave a like and share the stream with everyone that you know if you think they'd be interested also after the stream ends please leave a comment uh, to say what you thought and i'll see you on the next one cheers guys have a good one